So this presentation will be talking about performance testing. Um, and I want to specifically mention performance testing as opposed to load testing, as opposed to stress testing, as opposed to QA testing, as opposed to all these other terms. Um, really, the goal here is to actually isolate those terms and talk about what each one of those means to us, at least. Um, and certainly want to hear kind of your, your perspective on that as well. So first, I just want to introduce both of us. Um, I'm Eric Webb. I'm a senior technical consultant at Acquia. Um, I focus almost entirely on infrastructure performance, scalability. Um, this is what I do probably 90% of my time. Um, so big projects, scaling issues, infrastructure tuning, really the, the whole range there. Um, I've been working with Acquia for a little over three years now, um, seeing how it's grown over time, how the clients have grown. And also, my background, maybe to point out specifically to some of you guys, is actually more from the system side. So I've done Drupal development for a little while, but I actually come into this from the systems administration side, automation, Red Hat, that whole side of the world. Um, so I probably identify with some of you guys on that. Uh, and I'm Jeff Beeman. I'm also a senior technical consultant with Acquia. Um, my focus is not performance and scalability on a day-to-day -day basis, and sort of the reason I'm here is to talk about why that doesn't matter, um, because I have to care about performance anyways. Um, I joined Acquia in 2010, so a little bit after Eric. Uh, I've been working with Drupal for quite a long time, uh, and my primary role on projects is usually as a lead architect. Um, so in that role, I have to care about everything related to the Drupal site, including how it performs. So that's kind of the key point that we'll keep mentioning throughout all this is performance testing isn't something just for systems or just for developers or just for kind of that final launch date. It's really something everyone needs to buy into. Not everyone's going to write tests, but everyone's going to be part of the process. And there's, there's a lot of things that go into the plan. We'll kind of go into these a little bit more, but really important things like making sure you're representing what the users are doing, not what you think is important, not what you think your clients are going to want to have perform best, not what was first or last in the project, but really what is actually going to make the site money if that's your goal or get the most information out if that's your goal. Whatever the purpose of your site is, that's really what you want to make sure people are able to get to as quickly and efficiently as possible. Um, making sure that those tests that you're writing, you're actually scripting that in a way that really simulates what a user is. And we'll come back to kind of variability and randomness. But making sure that if a user is performing some kind of path through the site, they're not going to perform the exact same path every time. Make sure that, that you're seeing things a little bit differently you're actually really trying to get ahead of what your users are going to do, click in the wrong places, just do a bunch of things that actually simulates what the real world is going to be. Um, and lastly, what are we going to do to actually analyze those results? So it's really easy to look at those numbers and just say, well, it looks good enough or better than before or the client's happy with it. But the whole point of putting things in the numbers is so that you can actually look at those results and know exactly where you're at. Um, so we'll Again, the biggest thing is this performance testing is for everyone. So I actually want to say in the kind of abstract for this session, I actually kind of put a call out to all those different roles. So I'm actually curious, how many of you guys are, would you say, your developers first? Right, that's what I how many of you guys would you say are like sysadmin, backend, engineers? Okay. How many of you guys are PMs? It's better than that. <laughs> Um, but I, I think that's actually the PMs who I actually want to really kind of hear feedback from at the end and kind of reach out to. Uh, because I feel like developers, they want to learn the tools, they want to learn the processes, but ultimately it's all about getting the client happy and making sure the project health as a whole is really going in the right direction. Um, so hopefully all you, the different roles out here can really get something out of this. So um, I look forward to kind of hearing different feedback from all the different perspectives. So before we get too far in the discussion, uh, it's really important for us to level
level set on some terminology and talk about uh, the various things that go into performance testing. Um, because, like Eric was kind of hinting at, performance testing isn't just load testing. And it's not just loading a page on your site and seeing how fast it is or finding slow queries, things like that. There are, there are lots of uh, aspects to performance testing. So we're going to talk about some terminology, and some of it you, may, you might use different words to talk about these things, but um, it's important to have clear lines in your mind about what some of these things are. Performance is about the speed or the time it takes to do an individual request. Uh, this can be both from the time a user requests a page to the amount of time that it takes for that page to come back. But there are also other things that go into measuring performance of a page. How long does it take to render? How long does it take for all the assets to come back? Um, are there JavaScripts executing on the page that make it take a long time to actually fully render? Things like that. So that's performance. Scalability is the ability of your site to go from like one user to a hundred users, or a hundred users to a thousand users, and still have a predictable performance threshold. Um, and predictable being like not the same. A hundred users hitting your site is probably going to perform a little bit differently than a thousand users hitting your site, or ten thousand users hitting your site. But it's acceptable and it's predictable. Uh, that's what scalability is about. Really, a lot of these actually are um, not only complementary, they're actually opposing in some way. So, like performance and scalability, a lot of times you can give up some performance to enhance scalability. Um, I think that's one thing to kind of keep in mind through all this is you can do the, the performance is great, but is your goal to have each user happy? Um, there was a lot of discussion when Drupal 7 came out about how Drupal 7 was slower. And the, the whole idea with Drupal 7, though, was that it could scale much further than prior versions of Drupal. So just because an individual page request is slower doesn't mean your site is performing worse. You might just have to give up some speed on individual page requests in order to be able to handle a enormous volume of page requests. Um, next term is scaling. So scaling is probably a concept most of you are familiar with. Um, it's probably the area most people start with when they're looking at performance. Scaling is saying we want to take our two small servers down in the corner there, and we want to make them bigger. That's scaling vertically. Uh, if you scale horizontally, that's taking your two small servers down there in the corner and just adding more of them. Make sense? All right. So load testing is about focusing on real-world traffic problems and seeing what happens to your site for measurable amounts of traffic. So in the slide here, we've got... 10 users hitting our site and our server is happy. When we throw 100 users at our site, our server's, you know, it's straining a little bit. It's, it's having a little bit of a hard time. Load testing is not about breaking your site. Load testing is saying, I want to throw X number of users at the site and we're going to measure and see what happens. Stress testing is about seeing what happens or how far you can push your site before it breaks. Other people call this like a smoke test. Um, and stress testing is about saying, like, how many people can we throw out the site before it crashes and burns? Um, I like to think about, like, um, a load test being, like, how much does... I'm going to get a scale, and I'm going to see uh, how much 10 people weigh. Um, and we measure that. We can say 10 people weigh 1,200 pounds. Um, but a stress test is taking a scale and putting people on it until the scale breaks. Um, last
last one that we're going to talk about, and we're going to talk about a lot, you'll hear us use this word a whole lot, is contention. Um, contention is a fight over resources. And um, there are lots of places that you can end up having contention in your site. Um, it's We found this to be the hardest thing to, like, draw a diagram of, and it's probably the hardest thing to talk about, but it's also the most important concept to understand when you're uh, thinking about performance. Um, I think one way you can think about contention is uh, to think about Walmart on Black Friday. So a whole bunch of people, a mass of people line up at the doors, and then they open this tiny doorway, and puts about four people across into the store, and everybody wants to get in at once. And there's a fight over the resources, both to get in, and then there's a fight over the resources inside, and there are many points of contention inside that store on Black Friday. Right, so contention's a big thing that prevents you from... Um, contention's a big thing that prevents you from being able to scale at some kind of measurable rate. You go from one server to two servers, Theoretically, you should be able to take twice as many requests, right? Contention is a place that comes in to say, well, you could do the first server just because that's where your contention was, and then the second server doesn't actually help the problem at all. So that's why it's so key that if you can identify where the contention is, it's, that is what is going to block you from scaling in whatever direction you want. That's the key thing that's actually going to stop you from, from reaching those goals, from reaching that next level of performance that you want. And we've got some, we've got a couple slides a little bit later of contention is, is a concept you don't understand um, that try to explain it a little bit more. But for right now, just try to think of it as a fight over resources. Um, and that will help, hopefully help you understand uh, some specific examples. So let's talk about what your tests are actually meant to do. Um, so we kind of are breaking up this presentation a little bit into what you should do and also kind of the lessons learned from projects we've, we've worked on in the past and what we've actually done that maybe failed on our projects or succeeded and did really well. Um, so certainly coming up from both perspectives. So the key is if your tests aren't good, the numbers you get for them are essentially irrelevant. If your tests are fantastic, then you can use those numbers and actually decide how much money are you going to spend on servers? How much time are you going to spend on further testing? The, t the quality of the test is really the valuable piece. Make sure you're setting technical goals. So don't look at this as what makes a user happy and trying to guess what that is. Actually track these things over time. Look at when you add feature X, what percentage difference is there? So site getting is the load test showing it's getting faster? Is the load test saying it's getting slower? What's actually happening over time? And what are you doing to actually monitor that change side by side? If you're not looking at it side by side, it's really easy to get three quarters of the way into a project and really have no idea what that bottleneck is. Um, and that's usually where you find the biggest amount of time spent on tuning these things is you're so far down the line of the project, you end up throwing more human resources at it to solve a problem that Realistically, you could have caught much earlier in the process by just taking it step by step. Um, make sure there's no regressions that are actually happening. So, regressions from the QA, from the typical QA sense of features aren't breaking other features. It's just as easy that new features could worsen the performance of other features. So, anything that you're thinking about in QA of what makes a good test, how much you're testing, how wide that opportunity is. It should go right into performance testing. It's really not any different. Um, I think this is this is one where, area where um, bringing my sort of non-performance expert uh, opinion into the conversation is important. My role on projects is typically leading architecture, working with partners who are building features for our clients, and um, we found I. I made mistakes on this stuff, just like everybody else, we found that if we don't do performance testing throughout a project, it can be 
you, can you wait until you've built a massive project that's very complex and has lots of moving pieces? It can be really difficult to impossible to identify where your site is slow. Um, but if you're constantly monitoring performance and as you add features to your site, you're constantly testing them and seeing how they perform, uh, you can set yourself up for a lot more success and also reduce risk of having to spend a ton of money at the end of your project, a ton of money or time or resources at the end of your project trying to figure out why your site crashes and burns when you want to. Um, uh, a good, a, a, another good thing to keep in mind is when you build a feature, uh, and this goes back to sort of the data type of stuff, is um, build a feature and like let's say you're building uh, an article content type. It's really simple. Everybody probably does it on their sites. Um, you don't want to just make a few of them and refresh the page and see how long it takes for a page to load. What happens when you make a lot of them? What happens when you make the number of articles that are probably going to exist in this site? Uh, so those are the kinds of things to think about when, uh, like when Eric is talking about monitoring changes to your projects and thinking about what ways that users are actually going to use your site. Absolutely. And I, another kind of coming back to sort of the system side of this, the systems engineer, is a lot of these tests, if these tests are run early on in the project and maybe they're bad tests, maybe they're kind of exaggerated, whatever they're showing, I've seen a lot of projects create all kinds of crazy complexity in their infrastructure because they had one bad test early on. And it's really easy to see that and just start scaling out horizontally, doing crazy things like sharding databases early in a project or, you know, these really complex ideas that it's so early in the project, you can actually fix these things periodically. It's much easier to do that than actually create this complexity. And not only at the end do you not have tests to verify what's going on, you have an infrastructure that you probably can't even maintain. So you've actually created twice the complexity just by not keeping up with things over time, over the whole course of the project. Um, and also when, when we look at this, one thing that I always do going into client sites, um, I do a lot of one week kind of short audit type engagements, is I'm usually kind of pitted against on one side the developers and on one side the systems because both of them are always right, right? Or the other one's always wrong, or they're both always wrong if you ask someone else. Um, and testing to get those numbers, it's amazing how that changes the entire working attitude of these two groups because the infrastructure folks can make a quick change, see what it does. If it's good, they leave it. If it's bad, they flip it back. Developers the exact same way. So just having these kind of indisputable numbers to work off of it makes the entire working relationship of bringing together these very different teams makes that whole process much easier. So talking about the quantifying aspect of this, one of the worst things I see is people running load tests when it's actually a stress test. You know, we want to see how many thousands of users we can handle. If you're only ever going to have a thousand of those, you're going to be making all kinds of crazy changes for a situation that's not going to happen. What are you actually trying to achieve by these load tests? Is it a certain number of users? Is it making sure that your servers aren't falling over? Is it making sure that each request is only taking a certain amount of time? Really think about what it means to actually have a successful performance test. It's really probably the most common thing is X number of users. Well, that's great, but if X number of users are performing badly, is that a success or not? Right? If they're getting all the results they want, but it's taking five seconds, they're not going to be happy, but you haven't defined that. You don't know what's a success and what's a failure. So it's really important to look at each one of these levels, each one of these metrics, and actually find out what you can do to look at the results of the test, say that was a success or that was a failure, and move on from there. If you don't have that, you get lost in the numbers. You're, you know, That's where the blame comes in of, we support the users, but it's slow to cause that. Um, really set these up at the beginning. And I think this is a good example of where kind of the, the project manager role comes in, is maybe it's not the load on a server. Maybe that's not what's important to the project, but 
you want to be able to support 5,000 users at a time with under three seconds per user and no users over five seconds, right? Something like that where you can put a full, solid sentence and every time you do a load test, go back and just say yes or no. And everyone's under the same understanding, the developers, the systems, everyone can look at those results and know if they're moving ahead on the project or they've gotten ahead of themselves. So one thing that I want to throw out here is make sure you're gathering all the data. So if you're the client, don't trust yourself. If you're the consultant, don't trust the client. If you're the client, also don't trust the consultant. Right? That's the whole point of getting numbers. If you're getting numbers, that's what you're arguing against. You're not arguing against people or roles or responsibilities. The whole point is to make sure that whatever the goal is of the site, that's what you're accomplishing. Right? Does it feel slower? That doesn't really matter. Does it feel faster? That's not really what, that defeats all purpose of doing the test and getting the numbers. Um, one thing that's key is if you're actually looking at um, finding the most value. So one thing where performance is very different than something like security is one small security issue can really escalate very quickly. One small performance issue certainly has that risk, but it's a little bit different. Right, if 80% of the traffic is one user path, that's a great place to dive in and try and find the most the most important changes you can make in a short amount of time. So making sure you understand the full use case. Um, so when you're not sure what that full use case is, if you think it's doing a search, maybe it's doing a search and going all the way through to a purchase. Don't think about individual user actions. Think about what you're trying to get to. Because if you're building an e-commerce site, you want to know the time from someone who gets to the site to the time they make that order. Right? If they get frustrated anywhere in between, you've probably lost that order. So make sure you understand what the entry point is, what the exit point is, and what's really making the user happy and successful on the site. Um, and also, I think this applies to anyone. I mean, anyone, any of you guys that have taken the time to come to DrupalCon, you know, I'm biased, but come, we're coming to this session. Um, you're all smart people. I mean, don't think that you found numbers that aren't right. If you find numbers that you don't think are right, write a different test and see if it comes out the same way. You know, don't write one test, question it, and then move on to something else. You're all smart people. Write the good test, talk to the right people, see what you can do about getting those numbers where they need to be, and then finally move on from there. Um, you know, don't fall victim to what the numbers are saying. You're you're all smart people, just make sure you're actually utilizing the, all the skills you have and not just relying on those raw basic numbers. I think uh, one one thing we try to do, it's, it's like, it's funny, but it's true, is like, like the first bullet point, never trust the client, but there's also always trust your intuition and never trust your intuition. Always trust yourself, never trust yourself. And sometimes you do need to trust the client. It's kind of like the, when we were talking about it, it was like there is no spoon. Like, you, there is no right and wrong. You have to constantly be questioning your assumptions and your intuition, the client's assumptions, the client's intuition. Um, but then you also want to always trust it, too. Like, if, if a client is always, is constantly telling you saving an article page is slow and you can't replicate it, there's something going on there. You, you just may not be able to replicate it. You may need to dig deeper and figure out why. You may need to go watch them create an article and see what they're doing. They may be doing something crazy. Um, or they may be doing something that you never tested because every time you test creating an article, you just go ASDF, ASDF, and you hit save. I mean, we all do that, right? Um, the... Uh, the other thing I wanted to say about this uh, particular slide is um, around the important metrics that Eric was talking about, where if you've got, if your goal is that anonymous users are able to view pages in less than two seconds, no more than five seconds, or at least two seconds, no more than five seconds, and that is your primary goal, if 
you're focusing all your attention on why saving article pages is slow, you're not putting your effort into the right place. Because if there's like 10 authors on the site and they have to deal with the pain of saving an article page, um, that's not really impact. That's not really like the business case you have to solve. You need to solve the business case for the for the end users. If if that's a more severe problem. I keep mentioning e-commerce just because that's kind of the easiest place to see a visiting user has a particular value to the site. Um, but every site has some value from a user, whether it's getting them into some sort of business, just making contact with someone. Um, I just use e-commerce because it's a great example of your goal is for someone to buy it. Buy whatever your product is, buy whatever your service is. It's really easy to monetize that and look at the actual value. So I think e-commerce, just it's a great, simple case, but I'm sure each one of your websites, it has some value. It has something that you're trying to give to clients or get from clients. Um, the other thing is don't, don't give up until it's done. And this is kind of a mantra I use. Um, but most importantly, don't think that maybe you're newer to Drupal, but you know the system stuff, right? Again, you're all smart people, right? If the system stuff looks good, Dive into Drupal, see what happens. Get your hands dirty. If you need to write a core patch to fix something, um, you know, I was working on a client that had several hundred thousand nodes and I think five thousand taxonomy tags. And they're using type, you know, type like taxonomy access control. Um, and they were building out these huge queries where the query, from their perspective, each query was taking two or three seconds. So they spent probably a month tuning the database, putting on ridiculously big hardware, doing whatever they can to try and fix it. What they didn't do is realize the query itself was very fast. It was taking Drupal four or five seconds to build the query. So it was really easy for them to look at and say, oh, it's a slow query, let's go run off in here. But if you really get your hands dirty and realize what part of the page is slow, not just trying to, art not just trying to articulate what the big component is that's slow, you can actually dive in and look at the profile of a page and save weeks of effort. Don't don't get lost in Drupal. I mean, it's kind of ironic to say that since we're all here just for Drupal. Um, but really, if your site is part of a larger ecosystem in your company and Drupal is just one piece of it, you might not run into issues that the actual end user would see. Um, so one example of this is a consumer electronics company in New York. Um, they were running load tests on their Drupal site, no problems at all, varnish was working perfectly fine, no issues at all. What was happening was when the users were coming in, they were going to the main.com site, it was giving them a cookie that happened to match the configuration they were using in varnish for this actual Drupal site. So the only way to recreate the problem was to actually go back and think, what's the entire user story here? They go to the .com, they hop over to the blog, they click around, that's the user story. It's not just getting into Drupal. So their entire fix was to change their cookie name. And to save them, their site went down multiple times on Black Friday, Christmas Eve, I mean, every horrible time you can think of for a consumer electronics company. And it was about a two or three hour change. Don't get lost in thinking it has to be Drupal because Drupal's slow. It might not be Drupal itself. It might actually be some external service. It could even be a web service or whatever it is. Um, a Drupal site has other issues, <laughs> and those are all those other people out there. Um, make sure no, make sure everyone's checked the easy stuff. So you know, I, everyone has a great infrastructure team. Everyone has a great development team. But you're going to forget little stuff. And you're going to realize that if the servers are slow, maybe Varnish is just missing things. You don't think it is because when you click around, it's fine. But maybe it actually is causing an issue. And running tests throughout the day, throughout the course of the project, you'll actually catch those things. And last, and this is really key, at least from my perspective, don't accept anything less than perfect. So, you know, we talked about the article node type entry. You know, that's certainly talking about priorities, right? Could you launch with that? Of course. Um, but one case I've seen a lot, and this is a nonprofit education customer, was their site would just crawl when cron was running. Just absolutely crawl. And they
their solution to that, I'm sure most of you guys are thinking now, they turned off Chrome. Right? If it makes your site slow, get rid of it. Why would you ever need that? So, needless to say, they had some slight side effects on that. Um, but that's because it wasn't user facing, so they said, whatever, we'll turn it off. Um, so, these are kind of things that if, if you really start shipping away at what you're considering perfect, what's really making your site work, you're going to end up in this just kind of downward spiral, and it's going to take you months to come out of it, which no one wants to have that. You want to be developing cool stuff, not fixing your old stuff. I think uh, along those lines as well, um, something might work, but uh, there might be better solutions to it. Um, I worked on a project uh, last year that heavily used feeds, and uh, there were lots and lots and lots of feeds in that site. And theoretically, those feeds could be processed through cron. That's how feeds does its thing. But when we were talking about that literally thousands of feeds, we had to be more creative about how Drupal processed them. Because if we ran Drupal cron every minute, we get all this overhead of other stuff that happens during Drupal cron. So we were able to run those feed refreshes through Dresh itself. And um, and that was one case where, you know, it was acceptable, but it wasn't perfect. Right? And so we wanted to make it as good as it could be. Um, but yeah. I guess I need to speak up a little. <laughs> um, so uh, this uh, this set is talking about infrastructure. So uh, one very common mistake we see is using your dev environment for testing. So dev environments have a lot of overhead, uh, like you're running additional things that aren't being run in production, like xdebug or xhprop. You might be doing logging. Um, you might be using watchdog and uh, DB log, you might be logging to the database so that you have easier access to log messages in dev. Um, dev environments are typically on congested networks as well. So uh, your dev environment might be on the same server or in the same sort of uh, network as a whole bunch of other dev sites. And it's not going to give you a realistic uh, view of what performance looks like. Um, so the other thing is to not extrapolate results. So in this diagram, uh, this is a typical testing setup. Um, in the next step, we're adding more users. And we've um, scaled up our hardware a little bit, and the DB seemed fine last time. But in this case, this is going back to Eric's earlier example, where things were fine with a small number of users. Uh, but when we add more users, we start getting contention. And it doesn't matter that we scaled up our servers. It doesn't matter that we made our web servers bigger. That wasn't the problem. Right? And in this next step, we doubled the DB size, and we added more servers, and now we're better. So the whole idea here is don't assume that the results you get in one environment can be extrapolated to the next environment. Uh, similarly, and this is, again, related to contention, we do a small load test. And that might be really hard to see, so I'll kind of talk you through it. Um, the, the blue box on the bottom is a locking query, a query that does something that causes a lock in the site. That could literally be locking a table. It could be Drupal putting a lock, uh, using a lock itself. Something causes a lock on the process. And then we have a couple queries waiting. Um, but in the small load test, we get about 20 milliseconds of overhead for that last query. But as we add more people or we start waiting for that lock to clear, stuff piles up uh, and you get basically a traffic jam uh, on your server. And 
that's the tension of it. So our originally what was a 20 millisecond overhead for a query, you start piling additional queries on top of that, and you get more and more and more of wait time. Uh, if you want to say more about right. So the I mean, if you look at the first example, you're really going to look at averages in the in the end of your test, right? You're not going to look at how much the slowest query was and how much the fastest query was. You're going to look at this test and realize that this was a third of what each one of these is a third of the total time. As you actually stack these up, because the other locking queries are going to constantly add that overhead, 20 milliseconds, then 30, then 40, then 50, again, it doesn't matter how many requests are in there, they have to take at least that amount of time. So no matter how many requests you put in there, once there's a lock, everything else has to wait for that resource. Again, whether it's some sort of cache item in Drupal or an, literally a database lock, you have to start understanding what that buildup of overhead is to actually realize what the extrapolation would realize would look like. And when you really do a couple of these, the extrapolation just doesn't work unless there's no points of contention, which if you solve that problem, I'd love to help you. A good example here is when you clear Drupal's cache um, and the next page request that comes through uh, let's say you cleared the menu cache. The next page request that comes through has to rebuild that menu cache. It doesn't matter if just one request is coming or 5,000 requests are coming. You have to build the cache, and you only have to build it once, but all 5,000 of those requests need that same thing that's being built. So they're all waiting on that one thing to be done. Uh, so this next one, uh, your numbers are only as current as your last test. So you want to write smart tests. Don't just write a lot of tests. Saying that you want X percent of test coverage isn't always the best approach. Uh, what you want to do is write smart, strategic tests that truly target your use cases on your site. Um, so talk about user scenarios. Work with your business. Uh, work with the client to understand what is the path, the actual path through a site. Uh, like Eric was talking about that um, consumer electronics company. Um, if you didn't know that users started over in this other part of the site before they got to Drupal, you would never run into the problem that they ran into. Um, Use data from analytics. This is an, this is one area where you never want to trust what your client is telling you about their scenarios for the business. Get real data from analytics that tells you what the actual most visited pages are or what the most common path through the site is. Um, it's not that you don't want to test the scenarios that the client gave you. Um, you just want to use real data to inform what you're testing. You want to ensure variability, so uh, change what you're submitting in forms, change the path for a user, change how they navigate to a particular page. Um, uh, so you want to also measure test coverage, so both components on your page as well as the total page count. Um, and as you build new tests or build new features, build new tests. Um, make sure that you're testing the things that you're about to launch. Um, which gets to our next big point. And this is one we see all the time. All the time. Is that your tests aren't about launching your site. You don't write tests and run tests just to launch your site. You want to be building tests throughout your development cycle. You want to be building tests after you launch your site. Because nobody's, nobody in here, I, I imagine, nobody in here launches a site and then just like brushes their hands and walks away from it. <laughs> One guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, every time you add a new feature, you are changing your site and you need to test performance again. You can have you can have like dramatically unintended consequences when you add new features, and you could add a new feature over here 
that does something that you didn't think would affect at all uh, user performance over here, but it does. Um, so testing is about QA, and QA never stops, so your testing shouldn't either. Um, uh, yeah, the one, the one other note here is that when you launch, launching is about scale. Launching is about meeting the scale of the site when it goes live. It doesn't mean that your test, test patterns change. So continuous integration is for performance as well as continuous integration. Um, tools like Jenkins uh, provide mechanisms for you to do all kinds of things that aren't just about building and deploying your code. So we use tools like Jenkins a lot to do testing. So uh, ongoing uh, changes to your site, ongoing content entry into your site, things like that can affect performance over the long term. And by using a continuous integration tool that tracks results and, and measures results from tests, you can see over time trends in your site performance. Uh, and that's really important because if you're just in manually running tests every once in a while, you may completely miss the fact that every day for the last three months, performance has gotten a little bit worse. You may not be able to see that. But if you can go into Jenkins once a week and take a look at that graph and see that it's going up, you can proactively uh, take care of the issue before it becomes a, a problem. Yeah, and also when you're really thinking about more of the kind of pure sense of continuous integration, not only are you seeing it over time, but usually you're also seeing it when new code is created. So you can actually have that correlation of the performance got worse, and oh yeah, these are the last three code commits. So you're not having to trace back your whole site and figure out where that happened. You actually have all that data in one place, and you know, you know who to go talk to, you know who to go ask. Um, you're not looking at these milestone type tests where so much has changed, and it's really hard for you to sort of keep that bottled up and understand all those different steps. So the last thing, and this is really kind of the one piece where we'll get a little bit more technical, is talking about the different types of tools. So we've talked about load testing, and that's kind of what most people think of. But when you're really talking about performance testing, that broadens a little bit. There's a little bit more than just one thing to talk about. So make sure you're doing multiple types of testing. So it's really easy to look at that final end number of a load test and just use that as your solid single number that you're going to work off of. It's great, and ultimately that's what the real end users are probably going to experience, but there's plenty of different levels that are actually going to speed things up for you to work through the process. Um, so everything from request profiling, so for the developers in here, things like XHProf or XDebug, where you're really looking at the individual pieces of a page load and trying to find those problems. That goes back to the, the customer I was talking about that had the massive tap light query. They went to a certain page and saw bad performance. They jumped on the page. They didn't quite jump all the way down in the profile to realize it was one function call and go back up from there. So maybe use this for investigation and not really as a benchmark, but it is the first step while you're doing development to make sure it's performing the way you think it should. Um, service testing. So service testing is, the way I look at this is if you're getting a Drupal request, a single page, you're touching Apache or Nginx. You're touching MySQL, you might be touching Memcast, you're touching the network, you're touching all these different components, but it kind of manifests as the time of one request. Service testing is thinking about how long does it take for Apache to serve a static file, something where Apache is not really doing any work, or to run this query on MySQL. You know, maybe there's some network lag between MySQL and the web server. You're not really going to know that unless you test the two separately. Looking at something like MimSlack or MimCache date, um, you know, all these different things where you're really testing each level of the stack and even testing the network itself. Um, these are the kind of things that are going to make sure that you don't make some false assumption about that one final number. And the last two I think are a little bit 
harder to sort of compare. But what I look at as simple response testing, meaning something like Apache Bench or Siege or um, services like Kingdom, where you're going to get one single raw number of what the performance is. The amount of time, the amount of opportunity you have to react to that and sort of simulate what a real user is seeing can be sort of hit and miss. Um, so I look at this as something that you really use for monitoring and kind of real quick gut checks. Uh, but ultimately, of course, load testing is the final goal. So I we really have to jump in. Um, a, a quick anecdote. I worked with a client who um, we were seeing very slow performance on queries uh, to the database. But we couldn't explain it because we would go look at the query log. We'd find the query that was supposedly slow. And we'd go log into my MySQL, run the query, and it'd be fast. And um, Eric kind of hinted at it. But some place that we probably never would have checked until we sort of stumbled upon it was um, the latency between the web server and the database server. Uh, the time to make that connection and then send the request over and get it back was what was slow. And that's what, something like that is what service profiling is about as well, where you, like, even Devel's query log may not tell you that that's a problem. Or you'll see weird things like this query, like a cache get, which cache gets are, should be very quick. Um, it was slow, 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 or fast, 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 and then one of them was slow, and then it was fast, 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 and then another one was slow. That can hint at things like uh, that. Um, so load testing, I want to split into two different types. Um, and I think this is really a key thing from every level to understand what the end goal of load testing is. Um, first, I look at what is usually called virtual user load testing or virtual load testing. Um, and the goal here is really just to send a request out get that response back, and maybe react to it. Usually it's just a simple transaction. Um, there's not a whole lot of complexity to it or a lot of really interactivity. Um, and the cost I have down here, you'll see why that's relevant in a minute. Um, but these sorts of requests are cheap. It's designed to be efficient. You want to send out 5,000 requests with the least amount of resources possible. That's your goal here. It's maybe this is for stress testing, whatever the role is. Um, this really fits a specific purpose. Secondly, I look at what I look at as real performance, real load testing. So this is using something like Selenium or using something more browser-based, where it's actually loading the page as if it were an end user, performing actions with the mouse or the keyboard, actually doing what the user is doing, and getting those results. And if you look at the cost difference, the amount of resources required to do it a massive difference. I think 10x or more is usually a common gap um, because you're really looking at a full browser, full user, kind of full sign off of if this is going to work or not versus I sent out a HTTP request, I got a bunch of text back, and now I'm going to do something with it. They're naturally very, very different things. So just for instance, for virtual users using something like JMeter, you're sending out a bunch of these requests, maybe using XPath or some kind of regular expressions to pull something out. You read that, you make an action on it, and kind of those steps go on one after another. Whereas something like Selenium, you're really looking at what is a browser going to do to load this, right? Is there blocking JavaScript, right? That's not something you would see in, virtual load test, or in a virtual user load test. You really have to look at this and understand what the actual user is going to see and how browsers are going to interpret it. And maybe IE is slower than others. Shocking, probably. Um, but you can actually see differences there as well based on the client. And I think this gets to a really important part of performance testing that doesn't get talked about a lot, except by you know people who are sort of at the, at the cutting edge or um, uh, do maybe like a lot of mobile work, is that front-end performance is really critical, and it's something that, as developers, like back-end developers and sysadmins, we don't like to think about, because it's like, 
well, my server is serving up the stuff just fine. It's no big deal, right? My job is done. Um, but front-end performance can dramatically affect the end-user experience. You can get a report from the client that tells you that the site is slow and everything on the server side points to the site being fast. Um, but if they're waiting to download giant images or there's JavaScript that blocks, um, that, that essentially blocks rendering of the page for a certain amount of time, uh, or a bunch of analytics stuff is going on, that's usually the most common problem. Um, if you've got like 10 JavaScript libraries making all kinds of analytics calls, that can make your site slow. Um, but you wouldn't see that on the back end. So, really, I think overall, I want to look at this as kind of a holistic effort of developers have their role in it, QA testers have their role in it, um, systems have their role in it, but each one of these really fits into the whole process. Um, so it's really key that everyone's involved and everyone's under the same understanding and use those numbers to make everyone's life and make the communication a little bit easier. Um, so I hope some people have some questions up at the mic here. Um, just while people are going up there, I want to mention we are hiring massively. Um, but I think specifically the kind of stuff that we're doing here, this is what people like me and Jeff do on an everyday basis. So if this is the kind of stuff that really interests you, um, definitely come talk to us after the session. We'll, uh, yeah, I'd love to meet you guys. Um, and we'll take the Christmas ring. Um, if there's any questions left over or things you think of later, just reach out to either or both of us on Twitter. Um, and we'd be happy to continue the conversation there. Yeah. Hi, my name is Albert uh, from TV1 in Montreal. Um, I have a quick question about uh, the tool you're using in Jenkins to design the, to create those graphs, uh, those performance graphs. Is that, is, what extension are you using in uh, Jenkins for that? Um, so that particular example is using JMeter and getting the XUnit files out of it, or X, uh, what's the Java? JUnit. JMeter and JUnit, okay. Yeah, um, so it outputs kind of a standard data format, um, and that's what it uses to graph that. So it can actually pull Selenium results the same way and a bunch of other services. It's kind of a common format. Cool. Uh, another quick question. Um, I've started, uh, I, I want to test uh, IE. So what I have is one machine that's testing with Selenium, uh, Firefox, and Chrome, and then it, it sets, if that passes, it sets the, uh, it sets a different branch to, uh, so that it, another instance of Jenkins running on Windows is going to test IE. Is that, does that make sense, like, uh, to you guys? Yeah, it makes more sense than running IE on on Linux or Windows or Mac. Uh, I mean, at a certain point, that is realistic, right? I mean, at a certain point, testing that on Windows and testing on Mac and testing on IE and all these combinations, that's what users are going to do. So that's going to be the most accurate way to do it. Hi, this was, this was really nice validation for sort of the direction I've been trying to steer my team toward. Um, I'm really curious what tools you're using to generate the numbers. You talked a lot about it, about evaluating the numbers, but I didn't see too many examples in your presentation about which tools, like, for instance, you know, siege testing. I mean, you know, there's obviously a lot of things, and we've sort of danced around it. I'm just curious if you could, you know, if there are a laundry list um, that you could basically say, you know, here's the, the top five or six things we're using to generate those test numbers that you're then talking about evaluating. Sure. So for me, request profiling, XHPROF is the biggest thing. That's what I use to jump into a project. Um, for, for service testing, uh, using things like Sysbench for MySQL, um, using just a basic static file for Apache. Um, for Varnish, I'll actually set up basically a URL that Varnish returns directly and test that um, using Siege or AB or one of those tools. Um, for, my, for Mimcast, I use Mimslack which is a tool that comes with pretty much any installation of Mimcast. Um, for the real user load testing, there's things like Sosta, there's things like Keynote, um, Apica or Apica, or however it's pronounced. Um, I mean, there's tons of services out there. Um, I mean, really, a lot of this comes down to almost vendor at a certain point. Um, so as long as it's performing this role, and that's why I kind of avoided using too many like, product names or anything, uh, as long as you get what it's trying to do, 
and you can sort of map that to a features list and really knowing what you're getting out of the product, that's really the key here because there's plenty of uh, plenty of tools that will get you essentially the same numbers. Thank you. Yeah, yeah that's, that's exactly what I was hoping you say because there's just so many options out there and it's nice to know that basically it doesn't really matter. The tool you're using, it's creating that measurable metric that you can then see the trends on. So. Right, and maybe even those testing tools, you compare the two of those. Right, you kind of look at what one's doing versus another and try and see the difference. I mean, that's the beauty of numbers is you know which one worked better. Um, so, you know, don't even think that one tool is the be all end all solution. Um, so, you talk about how your numbers are only as good as your tests, and it really takes good tests. How do you determine that a test is good versus a bad test? Well, I think a lot of that really comes down to understanding some of these things of what's happening maybe a little bit outside of Drupal, or what could a user do, or what kind of randomness is there, right? Variation, like if I go to the home page of a site, am I going to click on the top one every time? No, I may click on the top one, the bottom one, the third one, the fifth one. Having that kind of variation that simulates what a user would do. So when I say good test or smart test, I really think of what would a user do? What am I trying to understand a user's role on the site and what they're going to do? Use analytics, use these other tools to understand what that is, and that's what a good test is. So it's about figuring out the realistic actions of the user. Right. Because right. Yeah, that, that's where you're going to make money, that's where you're going to get visitors returning, that's that's the sticking point. Right, like if, if you're running an e-commerce site and your typical user buy, adds a few products to their cart, removes the product, adds another product, and then checks out, your test shouldn't be user goes and adds a product and checks out. You know, you want to you want to test a realistic scenario. And you can even put randomness in there, and that's the beauty of the automated testing is going to someone and saying, well, today do two products and tomorrow do 46. It's not going to be a real happy QA test. <laughs> but if you can automate that and say, I wonder what happens if there's 150 items in there or 30. Is it scaling linearly? Is there some pop there? You know, those are the kind of things that say if it's a good test or not, is could a user go in and just start doing this or accidentally click buttons or uh, maybe they've done this over a course of time and added all these to their cart and grew. Um, you know, really think about what the user is doing because that's what makes that user valuable to your site. Thanks. Uh, like I mentioned, if there are any follow-up questions, feedback for us personally, um, feel free to reach out to either of, either of us on Twitter. Um, look forward to hearing from you guys. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>